and welcome. Uh, we are honored and delighted tonight to have a discussion, a launch of Dr. Westina Matthews' remarkable book, This Band of Sisterhood, uh, Black Women Bishops on Race, Faith, and the Church. It's terrific to be together. Um, thank you for putting in where you're joining from. Uh, recognize the partners who, well, West has brought together so many partners for both this book and this event, but the partners for this evening's uh, conversation. So the Washington National Cathedral, Trinity Church, Wall Street, the Absalom Jones Center, and I'm pleased uh, Church of the Heavenly Rest here in New York. We're going to start tonight with a prayer from uh, my great friend, the Dean of Episcopal Divinity School and the Canon Theologian for Washington National Cathedral, Dean Kelly Brown Douglas. And then she'll be followed by Phil Jackson, the priest in charge at Trinity Wall Street. Dean Douglas, welcome. Thanks for praying for us. Thank, thank you, uh, Matt. And it is wonderful to be here with you uh, this evening. And I first, before we pray, would like to, on behalf of the Dean of the Cathedral, uh, Washington National Cathedral, Randy Holler, the clergy staff in the cathedral community, to welcome you, of course, all to this virtual event. And most of all, I want to say what a privilege it is for us to join with the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing, the Trinity Church Wall Street, and the Church of the Heavenly Rest, and partnering uh, with them to uh, bring this event. And thank you, uh, our bishops, uh, for sharing themselves with us. And so now, let us pray. Glorious and gracious God of Sarah and Abraham, Hagar, Ruth, and Naomi, Rachel, and Mary, as we come together on this evening, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may, with listening hearts, open minds, and loving spirits, be open to the seen and unseen possibilities before us, possibilities to grow and to expand our moral imaginations for what it means to be church, for what it means to be created in your image, and what it means to be Christian. In this evening of dialogue and learning, may we be renewed in our very commitment to be a part of that movement in bringing the world closer to the just future to which you promise us all. Let us leave this place as a band of sisters, brothers, siblings all, committed to continuing the work of the one who brings us together, your son, Jesus Christ, in his precious name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. B Kelly Brown Douglas, my friend, wonderful, beautiful prayer. Thank you, Matt, for uh, the introduction of, of everyone and getting us going. I'd like to welcome everyone and then uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, who is uh, Dr. Westina Matthews. I think we all know uh, Westina. Uh, she is an author, an adjunct professor at General Theological Seminary. She's a retreat leader par excellence, and she is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and so I would just like to introduce uh, Dr. Westina Matthews, who will, uh, will kick us off. Westina? Thank you. Good evening and hello, everyone. Thank you, Father Phil, for that kind inf introduction and a special thank you to Trinity Church Wall Street for providing all the beautiful graphic elements that was created for this event. We so appreciate it. <clears throat> and a heartfelt thank you to the partners. You've heard they are uh, who they are who've made this program possible. I'd also like to thank the eight Episcopal seminaries who are co-hosting this event. And I will name them each at the end of the program, but given our time constraints, I wanna move quickly to the conversation with the bishops since that's why we're really here. 
But let me say that, <clears throat> that to have such tremendous support shows you how special and historic is this gathering of the first black women diocesan bishops in the Episcopal church. As background to the viewing audience, allow me to give you a little context. So I'm gonna look down so I read it and I don't mess this up. But the legacy of black women bishops begins with the right Reverend Barbara C. Harris, who on September 24th, 1988, was elected suffragan bishop. That is a bishop who assists other bishops but does not have rights to succession of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts, becoming the first woman bishop in the Anglican community. Bishop Harris was succeeded as Bishop Suffragan by another black woman, the Right Reverend Gail Elizabeth Harris. This was the first time in the Episcopal Church in the United States that a woman was succeeded as bishop by another woman. It was not until 2016, 13 very long years later, that a black woman diocesan bishop, who is the primary bishop of the diocese, was elected. And in the next three very short years, there were then five black women elected as diocesan bishops. So let me introduce them to you now and order their consecration. And I'll ask them to put on their video and their audio. The Right Reverend Jennifer Baskerford Burles, the 11th Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis, consecrated in April 2017. The Right Reverend Carly J. Hughes, the 11th Bishop of the Diocese of Newark, consecrated September 2018. The Right Reverend Phoebe A. Rofe, the 4th Bishop of the Diocese of West Tennessee, May of 2019. I'm getting chills as I'm saying this. I just got to tell you. The Right Reverend Kimberly Kim Lucas, the 11th Bishop of the Diocese of Colorado, May 2019. And the Right Reverend Dr. Shannon McMean Brown, the 11th Bishop of the Diocese of Vermont, September 2019. There you are. I have missed you. It's so good to be with you again. In 2020, we met six times over nine months on Zoom, just like this, to engage in conversation. And as you in the viewing audience remember, it was an unprecedented time. The pandemic, racial injustice, and the presidential election. And from these conversations came the book, This Band of Sisterhood, which was released in July of this year. And the book is dedicated in loving memory to the late Bishop Barbara Harris. Before we begin, let me encourage the viewing audience to enter your questions into chat. If you're joining us on the webinar, if you're on Facebook uh, for the Church of Heavenly Rest, enter it there. Um, there will be an oppor opportunity to ask a few of those questions. So you can start entering them now, but I get to start. And similar to the way we handle the Zoom sessions for the book, the bishops have received the questions beforehand. And I'll pose a couple at a time and I'll open it up to the bishops to respond as they choose. We'll give about 10 minutes for each set of questions. So here's the first set. Given the historical significance of there being now five black women diocesan bishops elected within three years, and I'm sure the requests you receive for interviews and meetings were numerous. What prompted you to say yes to this book and to me because I didn't know you? And the second part was over the nine months that we came together, were there any new insights that you learned about yourself or about one another? So I'm gonna start with Bishop Phoebe because this wouldn't have happened without her. So I'll give it to you first. Well, thank you, Westina, and let me also add my great thanks to all of the persons responsible for bringing this book to fruition and also this wonderful webinar. So yeah, Westina, you and I were at a Gathering of Leaders event and started a conversation that led us to this book. Um, you know, Bishop Jennifer's uh, election and consecration was so historic, and then for the other four of us to be elected in short succession. Um, we are in regular communication that won't surprise anybody listening as a real 
source of support. And we had been approached by other organizations, other media outlets. We felt though um, that we wanted to be strategic and prayerful and intentional about the first publication that included all five of our voices. Uh, for any of us in positions of public authority and power, the media can be a great asset and resource, but you know, words and thoughts and ideas can be misconstrued as well. And so for, for me personally, the thought of the lo longer format of the book, which would allow us to really share not just um, our thoughts about the church, but our own personal journeys, that was what drew me to this. And also the fact that Westina, I really felt like we could trust you in this process, but I certainly want to open it up to my sister bishops to see what led them to say yes. I'll, I'll jump in there. Hi, everyone. I will say that the trust question or notion is big. I said yes, because Phoebe asked. And, you know, the, the invitation came at a time that was already so full. And the first years of being a bishop were just rich and full, as we say. And so that discernment about what to say yes to, what to say no to, but when Phoebe asked and talked about what might be possible, um, you know, it was a real clear sense that this was a good thing to do and an opportunity to speak in a way that we might not be able to capture any other way. And so um, it's been an amazing journey. So I'm gonna, uh, who's gonna speak? Go ahead, no, Bishop Shannon, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, I just, I didn't care what we were talking about, just <laughs> to be with each other. Um, any opportunity to do that, I just thought that was a gift from God. I'm so glad that that you stirred this up and got us going on this. It, this has been, uh, I can't even place a value on it, invaluable. And there would be times I would tell everyone that they'd say, now, Westina, this doesn't go in the book. <laughs> so I would put down my pen and they would talk. And so um, that, that trust was very important. Um, Bishop Carlisle, I just wondered, over the nine months we came together, were there any new sites that you learned about yourself or about any of the other bishops? Um, I'm thinking about, you were the one who said, I was going to meet with you all individually, and you spoke up and said, no, 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 I want to I want to be with everyone. I want to hear the stories. Yeah, well, I think in part two, this all hit at such a confusing time. Mm -hmm. um, and in a time where we were being stretched in ways that you know, the whole world was being stretched in ways that we weren't um, prepared for, um, that we didn't understand. Um, and uh, there's so much about what we do and what we process that is difficult to talk to anybody else about other than somebody who's in it. And I, over and over again, I found in the nine months um, this constant affirmation to break it down to the least common denominator that I am not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that my experience is normative for these five women. Nobody else might be having be doing what we're dealing with, but for us, it is normal. And that really, I mean, I say it in a joking kind of way, but that gave me an incredible sense of peace and confidence. And I, I stopped worrying because I would hear what everybody else was doing and I was tracking right along with them. And I, I felt um, almost garden variety. I mean, I was like right in the middle of the pack, <laughs> you know? So it, it, it was a real sanity help in a time that was just insane. Absolutely. If I could follow up with that from you, Carly, you know, Westina, I don't know about you, but you could see the joy when we get to see each other. We all just go, <laughs> yay. I mean, because we, we have built that kind of relationship and it is such a blessing to have colleagues to whom you don't have to explain the crazy. You say the situation and they go, oh, yeah because they know it, they've experienced something like it, they've, they've been there. And so I have said to, to these women, they've heard me say it, that I don't know that I could do this without them. Um, mm -hmm. They have been such a source of prayerful support 
I mean, they remind me, you know, who, who's walking with me in this journey and they're with me and that, you know, we have the Holy Spirit together and that is so precious and so important. And the title for the book, at the end of each of our sessions, I would ask someone to pray. And Bishop Jennifer, if you get the book, she's in there like three times because, boy, she's a prayer warrior. She'd come right in. And so then I would start to say at the beginning, well, you know, Bishop Carlisle, I'll have you pray at the end so that people would be teed up. But it was, um, Bishop Carlisle, your prayer of this thanking God for this band of sisterhood in one of the craziest times of your life. And that's what inspired me for the title. So thank you for that. Let me go on to the second set of questions. The title of the last chapter is We Are the Church, which comes from Bishop Jennifer's initial question when we began back in March of 2020, when she asked, who is we, when we say we are the church? Who do you all, and so my question is, who do you see as leading the church today and how are they leading? So I'll start with you, Bishop Jennifer, since you were the one who had the question became the title of the last chapter, We Are the Church, so. Uh, I guess I'll start by saying that even talking about that came out of the sense I had that folks, we, are, we use the word we and we don't always qualify it. And we're a church that says everybody's welcome, every, everybody belongs, no exceptions. And yet there's a sense in which the history of the church and all kinds of institutions has meant that even though you might be included, you aren't really. So I, I like to be clear. When we say we, who are we speaking of? Are we speaking of people in leadership, folks on the margins? I mean, our church, our theology means that we, we believe the people of God are, um, are, are all of God's beloved. And those who would walk in the ways of Jesus in the Episcopal church are really varied and really diverse. And sometimes we only think of a really slim portion of the church. And so how to be really clear what we mean there so that when we say we, if we're being generous about that, we name it and claim it and gather all of the people we mean to be included in that we um, in there. So what I see around the church is leadership coming from all kinds of unexpected places. Um, I. I you know, I was thinking about how to answer this question, and I'm thinking about a young woman who's come up through the Union of Black Episcopalians, Christina, who came, I used to see her when she was young, going up through the ranks of coming to conferences, going to college, now she's out and she's doing some legislative work as an aide, and I just go, here's someone who's been leading, right? Like, she's not in the institution, but she has used all of the formation that she's gained as a part of this church to go out and be transformative in the world. And then there are folks with all kinds of institutional power that are working quietly on the sides who are leading women, women of color, who are just day in and day out doing it. Uh, let me say this, I saw Judy Conley come in the room. I'll give her a shout out. I remember all of the years and years and years of her working to help get the church to understand the importance of centering anti-racism training. Mm -hmm. and, and people were like, oh, again, Judy? Like, I mean, there was a thing, like we didn't want to have to talk about it. And so you fast forward 20 years of her being real, like leading on this. And it's just, you have the Epsom Jones Center for Racial Justice. We're talking about it really differently. Folks leading quietly in all kinds of ways. Um, and I, I, I hope that we can learn to continue to lift up those folks who are quietly leading. Thank you. So let me go to the second question. And then if anybody wants to weave into the first question because that's what you do that'll be just fine but here's the second question as you may recall our last meeting was on december 3rd and at the time i asked you all what you thought about the slate in chicago all people of color and i wondered if it was a sign of a turning um, or was it a fluke and as you know paula clark a black woman um, was elected bishop for the Diocese of Chicago, and she wrote the afterword for the book. And now we have Dr. Ketlin Solek, a Black woman, as bishop-elect for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, who will be consecrated on Saturday, November 13th. We now have seven, we will have seven Black women diocesan bishops. So here's my question. Will the day ever come that such a slate or election won't be newsworthy. Do you think the church is ready to embrace women, especially black women as diocesan bishops without having it to be considered an exception and newsworthy? 
And I'm gonna ask you, Bishop Kim, first to respond because you are very articulate in the book. And uh, you start out, I don't know how many of those slates we can have before they say it's too much, is how it starts. So right, that's, that's, that was part of my question. I remember being called as a rector in a church and I was the third woman and I remember someone making the remark, well, like, well, haven't we had enough women? And one of the women in the church said, as soon as we have the same amount of women as we have men before them, then we'll have enough. Um, and uh, while I was thrilled by Paula's election, I'm thrilled with the slate in Chicago, thrilled with uh, Catlin's election. I think we live in a world that is still struggling to accept the full humanity of women and the full humanity of black women, especially. Um, and so that's part of, of our leadership struggle. Like that's part of what we, um, I think have been tasked to do as, as black women. We got together and said, how can we lift one another up? How can we hold one another up? How can we remind one another of our gifts that we have been called to use for the building up of the church? And we do that for each other. That's what we do. And that's why it's, I, I wouldn't be here as Bishop in Colorado if Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs hadn't said, you need to think about this. We'll pray about it. We'll get on it. We'll lift this up because this is your call. And, and she was right. I have never felt more called to something in my life. And I think as we do that, we, we, we are changing the church and we are helping the church have a fuller vision of what the kingdom looks like. That, that's part of our call and our task. And so I think it's going to be a while before <laughs> we could say it's, yeah. it's not newsworthy. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a while too. I think it's going to be news and I don't think it's necessarily bad for it to be news. I think when things are changing and things are doorways are opening up for new people that it's going to be something that's front of mind that we talk about um I, the, uh, there are times where i wish there was a little bit less attention so you could just get the work done without yeah. having to deal with everybody's race stuff going on because i don't wake up in the morning going carly he's a black woman i just wake up and go i'm tired <laughs> 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 but but you've got to deal with all of that stuff going on. And it does strike me, and I, I remember hearing Jennifer say, that uh, is the first person I heard say this clearly, which is, it is easier to get elected as a Black woman in the Episcopal Church to be a bishop than it is to be rector of a cardinal parish and be a Black woman in the Episcopal Church. Until we get to that place where we see that sort of shift in leadership, and I don't mean only Black women, I mean anybody of any color, um, and the gender inequity mm -hmm. is just still a strange one, and we talk a good game. We talk an excellent game. Uh, we are so inclusive and we want everything to be the same, but when we get into those interviews, then we want somebody that matches the majority in the room. So I think it's going to be a while for it to be news, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it being news until we get to a place where things are um, a, a little bit more evenly mixed, where we match who's sitting in the pews, and we also match what is happening out in the rest of the world. Yeah. Amen. Right. Amen. And, you know, I would say it is going to take a while, but um, I'm in West Tennessee, and one of my uh, clergy persons has two young daughters, and uh, I am the only bishop that they know, and one of them asked their dad, Daddy, can boys be bishops? <laughs> and how amazing is that, that the only bishop she has known has been a woman? So to the extent that we get more women and people from all marginalized groups in positions of leadership and authority in the church, that is an important part of shifting that paradigm, because until you can see it, it's hard to really imagine it. So, you know, without us having to hold up a sign or protest or anything, just our embodied presence in our respective dioceses is changing the paradigm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shannon, I think you were gonna say something. Yeah, I was gonna say that, I, and it's important as much as nobody wants to be in a spotlight talking about, oh, I'm so different than other people. We do have to talk about it and, 
so that it keeps it on people's mind that this is something that we're still striving for. We've not gotten there. And it is so important for people to actually see this, you know, this difference and to not run away for, from it or act like, well, we can't talk about the difference because, well, well, we have to. And, and as we do that, you know, people actually start to believe, oh, wow, you know, maybe this is something that I'm called to as well. And they see the example, and then they're given permission to just bring them their whole selves to all of the ways that they are in church. And that's exactly what they, what we need. We can't just be, you know, seeing people that fit into a mold and none of us do. <laughs> and people need to see that and need to see us talking about that because it's, um, it's time to take off all these masks of pretending to be something that we're not as a church. You know, uh, if Chad, if I can follow up on that, I think and you, you said something about the difference it makes to the church, like our institution, but I think having, the, to the extent that representation matters in the church, it also matters outside the church. And so there's this incredible significance of having a position where people, thinking particularly of young Black women, seeing women in leadership, and then going, okay, well, I may not be called to life of ministry in the church, but I might be called to some other executive leadership out in the world. But because I've got these various images that show me what's possible, I see other possibilities just even more broadly. So, you know, I, I want to remind us that this is a wonderful thing for the Episcopal Church for us to reflect the, the fullness of the church, but it also has implications for the for the rest of the world, really, you know, because people will go and do all kinds of work and we're, we're a part of that diversity, that mosaic of, of diversity and leadership um, across many fields. And yeah. you remind me, and I want to get to the last question, so that I see questions coming in chat, so I want to give time for, the, for the, the audience to be able to ask questions, but you do remind me, I was going to have a chapter just on what it was to be a woman, and within the first 10 minutes of our conversation, you told me, you all told me, oh no, can't talk about just being a woman. I have to talk about being a black woman. And mm -hmm. so that was the conversation. So here's the, the last set of questions. Um, at the suggestion and encouragement of several of you, we now have a discussion guide available as a free, free, listen to me, everybody. Mm -hmm. It's a free PDF to download by going to church publishing website for the Band of Sisterhood, for those who are reading this Band of Sisterhood, and 17 individuals representing 11 dioceses, including your five, made up of both clergy and lay leaders, joined together to create this guide. So here's my question. What do you hope people will learn or come away with after reading this book? You know, I think I was just really touched. Um, I, I, read it all again today. I had not read it in one sitting mm -hmm. and I've read pieces here and there, but I just read the entire thing. And I got to the end and I thought you should journal. And I thought, no, I'm just going to sit here and cry for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I was so touched by the spiritual lives of everybody here and the journey that we have all been on and the, the number of people in the community that have walked with us and help us discern. And I think it's that piece, the discernment, the, the constantly asking where God, how God is God, asking that question. And I hope that people don't look at that and go, oh, look at them. I hope they look at that and go, what, how do I do that? I want every person that picks up that book to sit down with themselves before God and ask, why God, how God, when God, what, how do I listen? And I, I hope they're surrounded by people. Well, I know God will put the people in their path, but I, I just want people discerned to go be who it is you are called to be. The world is desperate for it. I think yeah. my hope is that Oh, go ahead, Shannon. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I hope that people will be inspired to be bold and courageous and adventurous and, and to have that all rooted in community and, and faith and the ways that they're strengthened by people who are like themselves and just be, I mean, that's all God needs you to be is who you are. Just do mm -hmm. it. And my hope would be that when people read this, that they, they see the power of faith. Mm -hmm. to move mountains, to change mm -hmm. systems, 
um, and and how we support one another in faith mm-hmm. makes a difference. I mean, I, that's that's something that I hope people read in that because when I, I I read it last week, Carly again, and I thought, well, yeah, you know, we we have walked in faith with one another and for one another, and and I hope people see that. Mm-hmm. One of the things I loved about the book was the experience of speaking together and learning each other's story. Yep. And I just thought right there as a model, like, you know, this is old. It's nothing like lightning new, but gathering with folks you want to be with on a journey and just listening and telling the story in whatever point of um, history that you're in, because it's always going to be influenced by the moment that you're living in. And these are some incredible times. And so if it inspires folks to gather around and talk about what they see and to ask deeper questions of themselves and of others that they want to know more about, then, you know, it'll, I think it'll be a, a good thing. And if it helps us to ask, if anyone who reads this book, then just looks at the world and the church differently and wonders who is not here or mm-hmm. why is this room looking the way it is? Why, yep. why is it not as diverse as we say we are? Mm-hmm. Those kinds of questions and, and reflections, I think, um, can be an ongoing gift to the church as we all sort of encounter them together. Yeah, I think that who's not at the table is always such an important uh, question for me. And uh, when I reread the book a couple of weeks ago, I was just really struck by how, um, you know, the biblical narrative is still alive and well, right? Like when we Mm -hmm. read from back in biblical days, people were in community, people were supporting one another, people were transmitting things orally. And yes, we have the benefit of technology and everything else, but none of us got to where we are by ourselves, right? We got Mm -hmm. to this point because we've been lifted up and a lot of people have prayed for us and supported us. And we're doing that, not just in this group, but hopefully we're doing it in our respective diocese as well. So in a sense, not a lot has changed over these many generations of people journeying um, with the Lord. And I think the five of us are just sort of an example of what that looks like in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. What I loved about the book, and I tell everybody, it's not bishop talk. You know, mm-hmm. I'm thinking you all are, and you're going to talk like bishop. You are really just like this. You're having the conversation among yourselves, mm-hmm. and I loved it. And I was so worried you'd take out some of the things that I really wanted in there, like <laughs> Bishop Carly about the girdles and the swish, 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 and, <laughs> and then you know, some different things that you, each of you told. And I was like, Oh, I hope they won't take that out and you let it stay in. So um, thank you for that. So I'm now going to turn it over to Matt Hyde, who will curate the questions. And thank you, Father Matt, and a special thank you to the Church of Heavenly Rest for providing the technology support on Zoom and on Facebook this evening. Thank you, Wistina. First, yeah, say thank you to Lucy Bridenthal and Julian Jameson for producing this evening. Also, thanks to Nancy Bryan who is the editor of the book at Church mm-hmm. Publishing for helping make this and so many other remarkable books possible. Uh, Bishops Jennifer, Carly, Phoebe, Kim, Shannon, thank you. I mean, the, the first thing we've seen in chat tonight is expression of gratitude uh, for you and for your leadership and for your courage and for your, your friendship with each other. So uh, most of what we're seeing in chat, first of all, is gratitude and um, for, for what you're offering tonight and what you offer in your leadership. So the first question is actually about your first day. So you've had the consecration. <laughs> and then what was that first day like when you were bishop of the diocese? Bishop Jennifer, I've heard a little bit about your first week from friends. Uh, so do you want to lead off? Because you had a not so quiet first week. Oh my gosh. So the, <laughs> it's funny, it's gotten out. So, you know, the first day, you know, my first day in the office, first day in the office, I, because I came in on a Tuesday, I had taken Monday off after the consecration weekend just to catch my breath. So I'm coming into the office as bishop for the first time ever. And the first phone call is from someone alerting me to a news story that was about to break. <laughs> and how I needed to respond to something happening at one of our congregations that was going to go into the news that day. And I just thought, I haven't even sat down in this chair. 
I mean, I was walking through the door. And so, you know, we had had this the situation with a, a church that had been graffitied and it, it was all this really complicated thing. The point is, I found myself on the very first day needing to speak to the diocese in a way that was what much more public, more much sooner certainly than I anticipated. And what it reminded me was that boy, when you're when you're bishop, it's just like go. <laughs> it's just like no, you just have to be ready. And so I was grateful to have um, a team at the time that could help me um, really react quickly and get a word out to the diocese and and to respond and to talk to the priest who was involved and settle folks down and begin a process that would get us to a good place. So. Bishop Carly. Gosh, I, you know, I'm having a hard time trying to remember the first day. <laughs> um, I, I, I think of the, the, the day after the consecration on Sunday, I guess really was the first day and we did not have a regular visitation. Um, we had me um, gather with uh, two churches that were doing an outside event. And so, you know, I, I preached and I visited with them and spent quite a bit of time with them. I, I was running on fumes mm -hmm. and I remember, I, I don't know how I got myself there and back. Um, except my best friend had helped me find it the night before. So I kind of remembered and um, I got back and I was starving and I couldn't find any place to eat and I didn't know my way around yet. So I pulled over to Burger King it was the only place I could find and sat down and had a burger and fell asleep sitting upright in Burger King. And when I woke up, realized, oh my God, I'm supposed to be at the cathedral. I'm, I'm being seated in 10 minutes. And I go driving up, someone takes the car, they get me out in the middle of the street. Someone takes the car. I didn't know how to put all those clothes on. Someone else helped me put all the clothes on. I mean, who thought this was a good idea to have me be at one group of churches for three hours, turn around and go be at another church and, and be at the cathedral and be seated. It was just kind of wild, but I do remember the moment where that day where I felt like, all right, I'm gonna take this bull by the horns. It was when the verger put me up in the pulpit and I don't preach in pulpits but I let him put me in the pulpit. And then I came down and I said, I'm the Bishop and I'm gonna stand wherever I wanna stand. And um, that's when it felt like, okay, I'm really here. Oh, Bishop Phoebe. You know, I didn't have anything as, you know, exciting as either of my two sister bishops, but I was seated at St. Mary's Cathedral in Memphis uh, the morning after. Um, I think I just, imagined or remember feeling such a mix of emotions, you know, gratitude and excitement, fear, <laughs> and just feeling like completely overwhelmed and Lord, what have you gotten me into? So to look out um, and to see family members and friends from all parts of my life uh, seated at St. Mary's Cathedral with me and then to have lunch with them afterwards was sort of a grounding that I needed after uh, an amazing, you know, Saturday consecration and then Sunday seating and, and first sermon at St. Mary's Cathedral. So I just remember such a mix of emotion that very first day. Bishop Kim. So um, the evening of my consecration, I was running across the road and I slipped and fell and smashed my sternum up against a pole and uh, woke up at 5 a.m. Uh, the Sunday that I was supposed to be seated at St. John's in the Wilderness Cathedral and could not breathe. I got dressed, got up, got dressed, put on my purple shirt and collar. Uh, my husband took me to the urgent care. The doctor said, you know, you haven't broken anything, but you've severely bruised your sternum. It's really swollen. And I said, I have to do a church service. And the doctor gave me a shot of Toradol and a steroid and said, this will get you through the church service. And I, I rolled up to St. John's and I preached and I did my thing. And um, by God's grace, the Toradol lasted the whole time. And I went home and got into bed and said, so this is what it's like to be a bishop. Um, so that was, that was my first day. And Bishop Shannon. 
Well, I'm thinking sort of like Phoebe, yet and when you asked that, I knew you were gonna ask this question and you know, there was such a blur because I'm thinking of, you know, consecration and it, it's all bleeds into the seating the next day. And the thing that, that I remember so much about that day is just the coming together, of, you know, all these emotions around just my whole life, people that I've known as a lay person and you know, seminary and doctoral studies and congregations that I served in different dioceses. And, it, you know, and, and that it, it wasn't about me, <laughs> but it was about the church. And then, and remembering my number, I mean, I know it's, it's 1,122, I call, call it 1122. And, <laughs> you know, it's just, I'm just one little small person in all of that, but then, you know, there's just something about being one of five too, that is a big deal and just, you know, really, really humbling. I have to say that, but then also struck by just the courage of my diocese and the irony and the surprise. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. Vermont is the second Vermont. state in the country. And then I couldn't stop laughing and crying about God's sense of humor you know, as I took the crozier and it's in the chapel in my, my house, I have had it out one other time since, because that was a crozier of the first Bishop of Vermont who defended mm -hmm. slavery in his book, a scriptural ecclesiastical and historical view of slavery from the days of the patriarch Abraham to the 19th century. My goodness, what a title. But anyway, um, I, you know, <laughs> I still laugh that I, I just can't believe God's sense of humor and all of that. And, and then, then to have, you know, like this full circle kind of thing happening with then the next thing that I, official thing that I did as a bishop. Um, I mean, yeah, I went back to, I mean, I already been working on planning convention, which was like four weeks away, but I was preparing for my first um, celebration of a renewal of ministry of a, a priest and the congregation, and, and that priest just happened to be my dad's seminary classmate. And so just, you know, ah, anyway, <laughs> not all the days are like that. And, you know, I, I still remember fondly that day, those sort of group of days. Well, so in the chat, after expressions of gratitude and, and, and really of awe for you five, uh, the most common question I'll ask and it's been asked a couple of different ways in chat, but I'll only ask it, but ask you to restructure it the way you would ask it. The question is, how do you increase the diversity of the Episcopal Church? And my question to y'all is not only how do we answer that, but what's, what's the best question to ask about that? So take it not only try to answer, it, but restructure it the way you think we should ask. I'll start. I think the, the question that I asked, I always ask myself is what I said earlier, and, and Jennifer alluded to it, who's not at the table? Mm -hmm. um, so you can be in an all-Black church, but maybe it's young people who aren't at the table. So any, any particular table that we find ourselves in, there's a good possibility that an important voice isn't there. Mm -hmm. So that's where I start. Um, but then if you're going to invite people to be at the table, that has all kinds of implications, right? So we're a liturgical church, so that has implications for preaching, for music, for style of liturgy, for Christian formation or adult education forum topics, for outreach, and just understanding that as we intentionally broaden and become more a reflection of God's kingdom, it's not slotting square pegs into round holes, but it's allowing those voices to influence and help us determine the future of the church. And that's, I think, sometimes the rub because we have these wonderful buildings with beautiful red doors and we're behind those doors and we're very welcoming when people walk in, but we kind of want them to fit into our existing model. And so there's a learning process, uh, perhaps for all of us, how can we be open to the Holy Spirit to allowing other people to help us influence what the church is? Thank you, Bishop. 
And from my perspective, Father Matthew, you know, when everybody says, well, how, how do we become more diverse? My first question is always why? Mm-hmm. Why do you want to be more diverse? Do you want to be more diverse so you can feel good about yourself? Or do you want to be more diverse because you feel like that's our gospel calling that we need all of those voices at the table? Do you want to be more diverse because you think the community is made better by that diversity? I mean, for me, the, the why is always mm-hmm. the, the important question. And if we're not clear about the why, we're never going to accomplish whatever it is we think we want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Uh, the why has to be central. Mm-hmm. And we've got this desire, I think, for diversity. I hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. And the thing I, you know, I, I wish I, if I had time to go and delve deeply into it, into academically, I'd, I would do it. But my sense is that we are only as diverse as our friendship circles. Hello. Right? Mm-hmm. And so if you're, I mean, I, I was asked a question, Priya Parker in Texas asked the clergy conference there, who first invited you to church? And I, you know, we were free to interpret the question however you wanted, but I thought my first going to the Episcopal church, no one invited me. I took myself there. Mm. And then when I found the church to be baptized in, I took myself there. No one invited me because it just, they, they didn't sync up that way. And so I wonder about how do we invite people? And then of those whom we invite, how diverse are those circles? And if we don't have diverse worlds in which we're living in, then the church is not going to be diverse either. And then once we decide, well, we're going to welcome in that diversity of whatever kind, whether it's race or class particularly, then we've got to figure out how do we really let go of those things that we treasure so much in order to be transformed and changed by other people. And so Stephanie Speller's um, new edition of her book, Radical Welcome, I think is a worthy read for the church right now. It's just as relevant as it was 15 years ago to help us ask the questions, well, if we really do value diversity, how much are we willing to change as um, a community to be able to allow that diversity to take? And I would add, for you know those of us that are have been in the church for a long time and and then you, you start to, I mean because I had I started to wonder I mean I don't know can I be in this church um and, and I thought wait this is my church I love this church and and this vision that we have for ourselves and the way to stick with it um is just being really clear with yourself about you know the gifts that you bring to the church um and and then also having a group of people that are like you that can affirm you when your church doesn't necessarily affirm Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. and that can remind you no yes you are you know child of god yes (laughs) all all the gifts that the church needs and you know and reminding yourself okay this is why i'm in it um and trusting that the Holy Spirit will bring strength and open some eyes and give you know more force to to the ways that you have to confront the things that still need to be addressed in the church. I think that friendship piece is vitally important. Mm-hmm. Um, in that, when when people ask me about that, I I ask them what their friends look like, and then I ask them what would it take for them to um, invite someone of a different color to their house for dinner or for the weekend? What would it take for them to go do the same at somebody else's house? And when you, the last time you you had a wedding or funeral in your your family, how many people were there of another color? Um, And that's where the rubber hits the road. And if you have no capacity to to maintain those friendships because it is you know it's a great blessing to be friends with people across culture and across race etc but it is work because mm-hmm. you've got to let them know who you are they've got to know who you, you've got to know who they are and all of that doesn't just come together smoothly um it it has some churn to it um and there's uh there's stumbling blocks along the way. And, you know, there's moments where things are really good. And then there's moments where you just kind of go, I just don't know who you are, do I? Um, and that's how we learn. Um, so I think it, you have to develop a capacity for that. Although sometimes I, you know, um, you know, being in this really white state, <laughs> there aren't necessarily people to invite to the, sorry, to the table. Um, 
<laughs> it's almost time for a compliment in my diocese. Sorry. Um, yeah, who do you invite to the table if you're living in an all white conversation, uh, um, you know, community? You don't necessarily have people around you, but I do know that people in, in my diocese were having conversations with themselves because they thought they should. And, you know, I don't, I think that that, you know, laid the ground for the possibility of me coming here. They weren't doing it for that reason, but they knew these were issues that they needed to deal with um, that are part of our society. And they could have just said, no, there's no black people around. There's no, you know, other people of color around that we need to try to relate to. So let's not talk about it, but they didn't do that. So how has your presence changed the House of Bishops? You thought? <laughs> What's it like for you to be in the house? There was a shuffling of tables very quickly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, that did, <laughs> it's an interesting time. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah. you're not well, wrong. I, 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 the <laughs> one thing that I do know that I've heard from people is that we speak. Mm -hmm. And we didn't wait to be in the house for a while to speak. We walked in talking. <laughs> You sure did. We're so shy. Can't you all tell? We're so shy. <laughs> shy or not. <laughs> so we had a couple questions. Um, one from a recent seminary gra graduate about your words of advice to the next group of leaders. Um, Bishop Jennifer, you talked about those quietly leading now. We have a number of folks um, whom y'all know, we know, um, who are joining tonight who are going to be on slates in the months and years to come. Mm -hmm. And at least one person who just graduated from seminary. So what's your advice to those folks who are coming along? The first thing is to make sure you have your posse, right? Like no one can do this alone. And we, we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before. And I, I learned this wisdom back when I was in seminary. So a long time ago that it takes a community of support and um, you don't need to call it a band of sisterhood. You can call it whatever it is that, that you want to call it. But having folks who can help pray you up and to help you um, reflect on the experience as you go, to help you see the things that you, you don't see because you can't see everything, and to help, you know, block and tackle when necessary. <laughs> like there's just a, there's a sense in which it doesn't, you can't start too soon to figure out how to have folks who can support you along in the journey because it isn't always smooth, uh, you know, and, and then when it is smooth, you want to have folks you can rejoice with as you um, go through the discernment and, and God willing towards ordination. Something that people said to me, oh, go ahead, Kim. You can go. Anyway. I'm just going to say, you know, what a number of people said to me, um, even when I was in the election process is um, this is a marathon and not a sprint. And so for anybody who's going into a leadership position in the church, there probably will be periods of frustration that things won't move quickly enough. And I just think we're in it for the long haul. So not to get weary and not to be discouraged when you inevitably hit some of those um, speed bumps in the road. Bishop for me, Kim. there's a big uh, matter. I had one of my bishops tell me that the question you ask yourself before you go into a parish is, can you love these people? Mm -hmm. And uh, he called me going on walkabout. He said, your discernment in this time is, can you love these people enough to lead them? Because if you don't love them, you can't lead them. And that has been such a shaping part of my understanding of ministry and how um, God calls me to be present with, with folks um, whether or not we, we agree on everything or not, my primary task is to reflect the love of Christ to them. And so my advice to anybody is like to, to know that your task is, is to love and to model and to support. That, that's what we do. And be yourself. Mm -hmm. When you're you know, trying to be someone else's, you will run into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Bishop Carly, do you have the last word? Uh, Bishop Sis said to me um, at, at my first ordination, um, you, were, you were answering a call when it came to this, don't go start looking for a job or a career now. 
Hmm. Keep answering a call. So thank you all. There are enough questions in chat. I think they want you to do another book. Uh, <laughs> Over to Westina with that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well okay a sequel huh no well we have two more so let's see but thank you all this was wonderful and so rich and there are so many questions there that you didn't get a chance to answer but thank you all for being a part of this let me just have a quick reminder and if they'll put it up of uh, the powerpoint um you can order this book if you haven't already done so by going to the church publishing website and using promo code BAND20. Uh, and that the discussion guide, again, is available free. There it is so that you see it, BAND20. And go to the next slide. And the discussion guide, it's a downloadable PDF free. Doesn't cost anything. Go to churchpublishing.org, this band of sisterhood, and you can download that uh, discussion guide. You can use it individually or as a group for your book clubs, uh, Advent, Lent. It's a great, it's a great um, effort. So we'll take that down. And I now have the pleasure of introducing to you and bringing to you Dr. Catherine Meeks, Executive Director of the Absalon Jones Center for Racial Healing. A sought after teacher and workshop leader, Dr. Meeks brings four decades of experience to the work of transforming the dismantling of racial injustice. You should know that Dr. Meeks wrote the foreword to the book. So Dr. Meeks, will you bring us the closing remarks? Yes, thank you so very much. What a wonderful opportunity to be here and to have this chance to, uh, first of all, hear this amazing conversation. But this amazing conversation tonight is so much like the uh, wonderful experience I had when I read the book and feeling like I was in conversation with this marvelous group of women. I'm, I just love uh, the fact that these are women who bring themselves to this task and bring themselves in a way that is going to be transformative for us and for, the, for all of us, for all of us who know them, all of us who uh, have any opportunity to engage with them. I've been, I'm just delighted to be a person who has a chance to interact with them as the leader of the Absalom Jones Center because the partnerships that we are able to form are just deep and incredibly rich. And, and it's really um, encouraging to believe that the Episcopal Church will move forward in some new ways because these women have been elected. Because the, the really good news is that there is no way to go backwards, not actually, even though we oftentimes like to, to try to do that. So I'm just uh, thinking that Bishop Barbara Harris is sitting with a great big smile on her face and many of the other people that uh, were trailblazers, Reverend Giddings and other, other folks. So I think that is just really uh, a, a great gift for us to have uh, God orchestrate the processes that has led these women to be leaders and that ultimately their biggest and best leg legacy will be grounded in the ways in which they have told the truth, the ways in which they have stood in their own truth and the ways in which they've invited us to be truth tellers and to stand in our truth as well. We as a group of faith, people living by faith and people who are living by faith in this group called the Episcopal Church know that we have got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of historical deficits to address, to acknowledge, and to do our best to compensate in some way for. And I believe that these women have the kind of courage and integrity and ability to have vision that can help to make it possible for us to do that work. It makes me feel hopeful in these times when one has to sit and quietly reflect upon the reasons to have hope when it comes to our institutions. 
it makes me feel hopeful that they're here and that they have these opportunities to stand up and be the leaders in the various dioceses and to exemplify what that kind of courageous, unapologetic, standing in your own truth leadership can, can be and can mean and can bring in, into, um, into being. I don't know sometimes if we are ready as a, as a country, as a, as a church to really be well, but sometimes God pushes us beyond what we think we're ready to do. So perhaps we have testified to our desire to be well more than we would be able to do with our mouths by simply electing these women who are not going to be people who simply just keep the status quo. So I'm here as one um, tiny part of that big cloud of witnesses of people that have struggled, of Black people in this country that have struggled for, for liberation and freedom. I am here as one tiny part of that great cloud of witnesses. So delighted to join with these women that have been here talking to us tonight. I said when I wrote the forward to this book that I wanted to call them a band of angels. I think that uh, I said a, a, a band of sisterhood and then I titled my forward uh, and a band of angels because I feel like they will trouble the waters I love and I expect them oh, to trouble the waters even more and I, I hope and pray to live to see all of the ways in which they do trouble the waters and hope that to see the way in which they're troubling the waters will help to make us be the church that God most envisioned that because we've got some work to do to catch up to God's vision. And I think that these women can help us do that. I am so honored to be here, to be a part of this conversation tonight. And thank you, Dr. Matthews, for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeks. So after the closing prayer from the very Reverend Kim Coleman, president of the Union of Black Episcopalians, we have a very special treat. So don't go away. You don't want to miss it. It's only about five minutes. I want you to stay with us. Um, and I saw in the chat about the recording, it will be up on the Church of Heavenly Rest website and Facebook page. All of the partners will see, receive a copy. All of the five dioceses will see it. So there'll be lots of opportunities for you to view this again. So let me thank again the partners. Um, we have the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing, the Church of Heavenly Rest, the Trinity Church Wall Street, and the Washington National Cathedral, and the seminaries, Berkeley Divinity School at Yale, Bexley Hall, Seabury Western Theological Federation, Church Divinity School of the Pacific, Episcopal Divinity School at Union, General Theological Seminary, the School of Theology, the University of the South, the Seminary of the Southwest, and Virginia Theological Seminary. And this couldn't have happened without all of you. And a very special thank you to Lois Deloach Goins, our vocalist, and Ernest Turner accompanying her on the organ for providing the music for our finale. Still stay with us after the closing prayer. Thank you and God bless. Mother Kim. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Matthews. And thank you especially to our five amazing black female diocesan bishops who are paving the way for others to follow. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we thank you for the abundance of gifts and talents with which you have blessed and equipped your church. We thank you especially for each one of these dedicated, faithful, Holy Spirit empowered disciples endued with both ebony and feminine grace who have followed you in answering your call to the Episcopacy. Grant them the courage they need to challenge stereotypes, the strength they need to refute racism, 
the wisdom they need to transform systems and the love, the endless unconditional love they need to give us all a new view on what being church means. Through their leadership, help us, your church, to learn and grow and make more room at the table for all people, especially persons of color, those on the fringes, and those who are hidden in the wide open as we strive to be more like your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Express. 
Yeah. 